Last class we were discussing about solids and biosolids treatment. We have seen what are the various sources of this solids or biosolids and what is the quantity of this biosolids coming from various treatment processes and what is the density, specific gravity of the sludge and the solids and the characteristics of the solids because these characteristics are very, very important when we go for the design of the treatment system and we were discussing about the flow chart or the general flow chart of the biosolids treatment. We have seen that it involves various steps and we have seen in detail the process those are involved in the pre-treatment as well as what are the methods we can use for dewatering the sludge because this dewatering is very, very important to reduce the volume of the sludge. If the volume is very, very high then naturally the treatment unit volume will be very high. The third step in the process diagram is stabilization because we have discussed about the pre-treatment which include degritting, grinding, blending and storage and then we talked about the dewatering processes. So, today we will see in detail what all are the methods usually used for stabilization of the sludge and first we will see what is the need of this stabilization. The solids and biosolids are stabilized to reduce pathogens and to eliminate offensive orders and inhibit or reduce the potential for further putrefication. Because we all know that the solids, it is nothing but in most of the cases, it will be active biomass and the primary sludge will be containing lot of pathogens, whatever is coming from the domestic as well as industrial waste water depending upon the source. So, if you just put the sludge or allow the sludge to lay like that, then these pathogens will be proliferating and it will be affecting the health of the people who are is coming in contact with the sludge. So, it is very much required to reduce the pathogens concentration in the sludge and we know that the sludge if it undergoes degradation or it will be emitting so much of bad orders. So, the major objective of this stabilization is to inhibit the bacterial growth because of the bacterial growth this mal orders and all are coming. So, if you can inhibit the microbial growth and stabilize the sludge then we will not be having this associated problems. Now, we will see what are the various methods used for the stabilization. There are different methods like alkaline stabilization, anaerobic digestion, aerobic digestion, autothermal, thermophilic digestion and composting. So, we will see each method in detail, but out of this one anaerobic digestion is the most commonly used method in wastewater treatment plants. So, we will be seeing each one in detail. Coming to alkaline stabilization, what we are doing is here we are adding alkaline chemicals that provide a condition non-conducive for microbial growth because when we add this chemicals to the biosolids or the sludge, what will happen? the pH of the system will be increasing above 7, above 10. So, what will happen? The microorganism will not be able to survive under this condition. If microorganisms are not surviving, so naturally there will not be any putrefication of the sludge. So, definitely the problem associated with the sludge will not be there like mal orders and other problems. So, the chemical reactions involved in this alkaline stabilization are as follows. If calcium is present in the sludge, it is combining with the bicarbonate because bicarbonate is coming from the chemical water we are adding. 
or cal calcium and bicarbonate if it is present in the sludge, if when we add this lime calcium oxide, you will be getting calcium carbonate and water and if phosphate is present in the system, phosphate will be reacting with calcium oxide to give calcium phosphate and water. And if carbon dioxide is there, it will be getting converted to calcium carbonate because cal carbon dioxide can reduce the pH of the system. And if organic matter is there, it will be combining with calcium oxide to form this calcium hydroxide. And if fat is present, fat will react with calcium hydroxide to form glycerol and fatty acids. So, each and every component present in the sludge will be reacting with calcium oxide or the lime whatever we are adding and the corresponding products will be forming and in the entire pH of the system will be above 10. So, no more microbial growth will be taking place. So, naturally the naturally we will be getting a stabilized sludge which, which does not have much problems. And this alkaline method we can go for pre alkaline treatment or post alkaline treatment. Pre alkaline treatment means it is applied before the dewatering and post alkaline treatment is after the dewatering and other treatments we are adding the alkali. So, it is divided into two categories and now we will see what is this advanced alkaline stabilization techniques. In ad advanced alkaline stabilization technique, we add quick lime along with other materials like cement, cement, kin, cement kin dust, lime kin dust or fly ash. So, what will happen when the quick lime react with this sludge that it is an exothermic reaction because of that one the temperature of the entire sludge will be rising up. So, at high temperature what will happen Pasteur, pasteurization of the sludge will be taking place. So, whatever pathogens present in the sludge everything will be getting destroyed and the materials like cement, kin dust, lime kin dust or fly ash will be reacting with the sludge and we will be getting a stabilized sludge. So, that is what I have written here. The quick lime reaction is exothermic. So, the temperature rise up to 70 degree centigrade and this temperature because the reaction takes some time. So, this high temperature will be maintaining for 30 minutes. So, a high temperature for a long time definitely result in pasteurization of the sludge. This is the schematic of an advanced alkaline stabilization system. So, here we have the sludge, this is the mixing tank and here the dust from the cement silo is coming and this is the feeder and we are having a sodium silicate tank and everything is getting mixed up here and we have a mixing pump here and from this one we are getting the stabilized, stabilized waste, it is going to a tram okay? and from here it can come to landfill or directly the stabilized waste we can put it into the landfill. So, we can see that how the sludge is getting stabilized by this alkaline stabilization method. Now, we will see the next stabilization method that is anaerobic digestion. It is the oldest and most commonly used method because we all have seen in wastewater treatment plants the anaerobic digesters which is used for treating the sludge whatever is coming out of the secondary sedimentation tank as well as the primary sedimentation tank. And this anaerobic digestion process, three different configurations or three different setups are available. One is conventional anaerobic digesters, second one is single stage high rate digesters and third one is two stage digester. In conventional anaerobic digester what is happening is okay, there is no recirculation or no external mixing. So, whatever the sludge is coming, it is put it in the digester and the anaerobic microorganisms present in the sludge or the digester will be degrading the sludge whatever is present in the digester. So, the mixing is taking place in the system because of the gas form in the system because we know that when the organic matter undergoes anaerobic digestion, it will be producing biogas consists of methane and carbon dioxide. Because of this gas formation, there will be turbulence in the system and the mixing of the constituents in the reactor will be taking place because of this gas. So, what is happening and there is no provision to maintain the microorganism or the anaerobic biomass whatever is 
generated in the system because there is no attached growth system or there is any specific arrangement to retain the sludge in the system. So, what will happen? The sludge will be getting digested and the supernatant will be going out of the reactor. So, along with the supernatant, a portion of the anaerobic microorganism also will be getting escaped. So, naturally, as the biomass concentration in the system is less, the detention time required for sludge digestion in conventional anaerobic digesters are very, very high. Usually, a detention time of 30 to 40 days are provided in conventional anaerobic digesters. And I will see in detail the design of a conventional anaerobic digester. Now, coming to single stage high rate digester. So, here what is happening? We are providing external heating and auxiliary mixing and uniform mating, uniform feeding and there is provision for thickening of feed system. So, what happens? We are heating up the system externally and we are mixing the system externally and we, we know that in anaerobic process to get optimum performance or maximum performance, the temperature of the system should be in the range of 37 plus or minus 2 degrees centigrade. So, if we can increase the temperature, definitely the activity of the microorganism will be increasing compared to low temperatures and we are providing external mixing. So, what will happen? Definitely there will be much better contact between the organic matter and the microorganism present in the system. So, that will definitely increase the ability or increase the efficiency of the treatment system. So, that is what is done in a single stage high rate digester. And here again provisions are there to maintain high microbial concentration. That is why we are calling it as a high rate digester because this high rate reactors we have discussed in detail when we were talking about anaerobic treatment of waste waters. So, for example, this picture shows a single stage high rate anaerobic digester. So, you see the this is a sludge heater. So, it will be heating the sludge inside the system. So, definitely it will be having a high temperature and the sludge is you can see these are the sludge inlets 1, 2, 3, 4 pots are there. So, the sludge is equally distributed along the depth of the reactor and we are having a external stirrer. We can see that this is the mixer. So, it is rotating. So, because of that one high turbulence is generated in the system. So, because of the high turbulence what is happening? The sludge and the microorganisms are having very high contact and these are the sludge outlets. So, we get digested sludge from here and this is a fixed cover. So, whatever bio biogas generated in the system will be getting stored here and it is collected through this outlet. So, we can see that we are getting methane and carbon dioxide. So, because of this sludge heating as well as the mixing and proper distribution of the sludge in the system, the reactor performance will be much, much better compared to the conventional anaerobic sludge digesters. So, now we will talk about two stage digester. Two stage digester is having two different tanks. The first stage tank is for digestion and is heated and mixed externally. And the second tank usually unheated and used as a storage facility. And these two stage digesters are not commonly used, but a modification of this one that is known as high rate anaerobic digesters is being used nowadays commonly. So, we will see how this two stage digester is performing. So, as I have already told it is having two different tanks. This is the first stage and this is the second stage. So, here what is happening? The sludge heater is there and sludge in inlet is there and there is a mixer. So, it is mixing the sludge and he here we have a fixer co cover and gas storage. And the sludge outlet, these are the sludge outlets. So, it, this is exactly the same as this one. So, what is happening in the second digester? This will be acting as a storage device. So, we can see that since this is acting as a storage and there is no turbulence, proper settling of the digested sludge will be taking place. So, what will happen? Here we can see that the digested sludge and here we get the supernatant layer and this is the scum layer and this is the gas 
gas storage and it is having a floating cover and as and when the gas volume increases then we can collect the gas and use for other purposes. So, in this digester what is the advantage is since the solids are getting concentrated and the water is getting separated the sludge the digested sludge volume in this reactor will be much less compared to a single stage system. So, we can see that we can take the sludge separately and we can take the supernatant se separately. So, this is the advantage of a two stage system. So, as I was mentioning there are high rate single stage anaerobic digesters. So, there what, what is being done is the first digester that will be exactly this way and whatever the outlet the sludge outlet sludge is coming out it will be allowed to settle in a secondary sedimentation tank and from that one the settled sludge will be pumped back to the first digester. So, what will happen in the biomass inside the first digester will be keep on increasing. So, if the biomass concentration in the digester is more definitely the performance of the digester will be much better. So, and if you want to see the bottom plan of the system we can see that this, this is the bottom plan here the sludge will be getting distributed and these are the withdrawal pods if you want to withdraw the sludge. So, the pods will, pods will be located around the periphery of the digester and this is the cross sectional of a cross sectional view of a anaerobic digester. So, we can see that this is the sludge withdrawal pipe and this is the top lid from where the gas can be collected and sometimes instead of providing a mechanical mixture gas the biogas water is produced and collected from here the same gas will be recirculated in the system. So, here we can see the gas recirculation. So, this gas recirculation itself will be giving a proper mixing of the system. So, th this way the efficiency of the system can be improved or increased. Now, we will see how to design an anaerobic digester. So, I am going to explain the design of a lauride digester. So, this is the one which is commonly used in wastewater treatment plants. So, first what we have to do? We have to find out what is the amount of sludge we have to treat. So, that we will be getting by knowing the volume of sludge from various treatment units because if you take a wastewater treatment plant basically the sludges whatever is coming from the primary sedimentation tank and secondary sedimentation tank are sent to the anaerobic digester. So, we know that what is the volume of sludge and we have seen what is the sludge specific gravity. So, from that one we can find out the mass of the sludge or if the mass of the sludge is known then we can find out the volume of the sludge. So, once we know the volume then what we have to do we have to decide what is the percentage destruction of volatile material we need in the digester. So, we usually we design the system for 50 to 60 percentage destruction of volatile material. That means, the sludge will be having fixed solids as well as volatile solids. The fixed solids will be remaining as such there will not be any change occurring for the fixed solids. Only the solids which can be destructed is the volatile solids because volatile solids are organic matter or organic solids. So, we design this one or choose this design value. Then what we have to do is we have to find out what is the hydraulic retention time required to achieve the desired efficiency. Now, as we were discussing about the anaerobic ponds or the pond system, we have seen depending upon the efficiency, okay, we can find out what is the k theta value and from that one we can find out what is the retention time required. So, if you want to achieve 50 percentage efficiency, we need a hydraulic retention time of 40 days this is available from the chart. Okay, this chart we have seen earlier and now what we have to do the third step. So, we have decided what is the destruction required and we have seen what is the hydraulic retention time required. Now, we have to see what is the quantity of all tile material in the total sludge. So, this also we can find out because we have the mixed sludge sample. So, from that one we can find out what is the volatile material in the total sludge. 
by using okay uh, take the sample take the dry weight and put it in the muffle furnace and increase the temperature up to 600 degree centigrade so whatever is lost at that temperature that is the volatile solids and whatever is left over in the system or in the muffle furnace heating so that is the fixed solids so that one also will be available then the next step is find out the quantity of inorganic matter in the digested sludge so we know what is the total volatile solids in the sludge then we know that 50 percentage of the volatile solids are getting distracted in the digestion process so we can find out what is the inorganic matter in the digested sludge because volatile solids concentration will be getting reduced by 50 percentage but fixed solids concentration will be remaining as such so we can find out what is the inorganic material present in the digested sludge now we can find out what is the total quantity of solids total quantity of solids is nothing but volatile solids plus fixed solids and find out percentage of volatile solids in the sludge and find out percentage of fixed solids in the sludge and now we have to find out what is the volume required or so we have to assume the consistency of the digested sludge so this consistency of the digested sludge is depending upon the withdrawal frequency so usually the consistency of the digested sludge in a conventional anaerobic digester varies from 4 to 6 percentage so we assume 5 percentage say in between this 4 and 6 so we can find out what is the volume of sludge because we know what is the total quantity of solids so we can and we know what is the consistency then we can find out what is the volume of sludge so we know what is the volatile solids what is the fixed solids and what is the digested volume then based upon that one we can find out what is the volume of digester volume of digester v is equal to vf minus 2 by 3 vf minus vd into t1 so vf is volume of raw mixed sludge per day and vd is the volume of digested sludge per day and t1 is the hydraulic retention time and usually we give a solid loading rate of 0.6 to 1.6 kg vss per day per meter cube so you find out the volume of the digester and check whether the loading is coming within this permissible limit then we have to provide space for gas storage and extra sludge storage during monsoon because during monsoon period what is happening we cannot take out the sludge the digested sludge and send it in, send it to the sludge drying beds so frequently as in summer because during monsoon period what will happen sludge drying will take lot of time so we have to provide provision for the extra storage now we'll see now we only got the volume so how can we decide the height as well as surface area of the digester so to find out the surface area of the digester the criteria is this gas production so what we assume is the gas production per kilogram of volatile matter destroyed is 0.9 meter cube so the area required is 9 meter cube of gas per day per meter squared if we have 9 meter cube gas production then at least we should provide 1 meter squared area because if the gas production is more than this one and the area is less what will happen lot of forming will be taking place in the reactor so to avoid the forming we have to give a more surface area so so this is the way we have to design the anaerobic digester so we we can find out the volume of the digester for the digestion purpose then we have to find out what is the extra volume we have to provide to store the sludge during monsoon period when we cannot withdraw the sludge frequently then we have to provide the space for gas storage and we have to also provide some depth or some space for the grease and scum storage so and we have seen what is the area required based upon the gas production so we know the volume and the extra volume sort of we have to provide that also we know so based upon that one we can find out what is the depth of the digester we have to provide so this is the design details of a conventional or standard rate anaerobic digester 
Now we will discuss about aerobic digestion. Okay, we have seen already alkaline digestion as well as anaerobic digestion, and I have already mentioned that anaerobic digestion is the method which is most commonly used in wastewater treatment plants for the stabilization of sludge. Now we will see how the aerobic digestion is being carried out. This process is used to treat the sludge from waste activated sludge process, mixtures of waste activated sludge and trickling filter sludge and waste sludge from external aeration system. The working principle of this aerobic digestion is the same as that we have seen in activated sludge process. So, this sludge is nothing but organic matter. So, if you provide microorganism and sufficient oxygen, what will happen? The microorganisms will be utilizing the organic matter and oxidizing it to carbon dioxide and water and in that process, they will be getting energy and more and more new cells will be generated. And we have also seen that in certain modification of the conventional activated sludge process like extended aeration system, we are aerating it for a long time or the food supply to the system is limited. So, what is happening? In the initial stages, more and more sludge will be, the more and more organic matter will be getting converted to biomass, but once the food is limiting, the biomass thus generated will be getting auto oxidized and it will be getting converted to carbon dioxide and water for the maintenance of the remaining cell and towards the end what will happen? Almost all the biomass present in the system will be getting exhausted or getting distracted. So, same principle can be used in aerobic digestion and definitely this performance or the volatile matter destruction efficiency is much high in aerobic digestion compared to anaerobic digestion. The reason is aerobic process is more efficient because more energy is liberated in aerobic process. So, the material whatever is required for catabolism is less compared to anaerobic process. So, definitely more microorganisms will be there in the system. So, now we will see what are the advantages of this anaerobic this aerobic digestion over anaerobic digestion. So, these are the advantages as I have already mentioned it is having good volatile solids re reduction potential and lower BOD concentration in the supernatant because if you see the supernatant from anaerobic digester the COD will be or the BOD will be very very high, but in aerobic digesters the supernatant or the liquid whatever is coming out of the digester will be having a lower BOD and it produces orderless stable end product. Whereas, in anaerobic digesters, odorous gases like hydrogen sulphide etcetera will be generated and recovery of more of the fertilizer value in the sludge. The sludge from aerobic digester will be having more fertilizer value compared to anaerobic sludge and here the operation is relatively easy and lower capital cost and suitable for digesting nutrient rich biosolids. But it is having definitely certain disadvantages because here the power requirement is very, very high because we are giving such a concentrated organic matter to the system. If you want to completely oxidize that organic matter, an equivalent amount of oxygen should be supplied to the system. So, if you want to supply high concentration of oxygen, definitely the power cost will be very, very high. And the second problem is whatever the sludge, digested sludge, whatever is coming out of the aerobic digester, it is having poor mechanical dewatering characteristics. That means, the sludge will be containing lot of water and dewatering the sludge will be very, very difficult compared to anaerobic sludge. So, we may have to go for some chemical conditioning and all if you want to try it properly. And this aerobic digestion will be easily affected by the temperature and tank geometry and mixing and aeration devices and concentration of feed solids because if the feeding is not proper or if there is fluctuations in the feeding that will be affecting the system and geometry of the tank is very, very important when we talk about the efficiency and as we have already discussed in aeration systems, here also the tank geometry is very important and another thing is 
temperature effect. In any biological system, when the temperature varies, if the temperature comes down, the efficiency of the system will be going down because we have discussed many times for every 10 degree change in temperature or rise in temperature, the activity will be increasing 100 percent and every 10 degree decrease in temperature, definitely the activity will be decreasing by 100 percent or there will be 100 percent or the efficiency will be coming down by 50 percentage. So, that is what is happening in aerobic digesters. Now, we will see what is the reactions that is taking place in aerobic digestion. So, this is the organic matter, it is having carbon atoms, hydrogen atoms, nitrogen atoms and oxygen. So, in aerobic process what is happening? We are completely oxidizing the organic matter. So, we are adding oxygen externally. So, what will happen? The carbon will be getting converted to carbon dioxide, hydrogen to water and this nit nitrogen whatever is present it is getting converted to ammonium bicarbonate. And again the ammonia whatever is present in the system, if we supply excess oxygen that will be getting converted to nitrate plus water and here again this is the same organic matter. If you supply the same oxygen together, here the oxygen supply was limited. So, that is why we are getting ammonia as one of the byproduct. But if you supply excess oxygen, so in the first step itself everything will be getting converted to carbon dioxide, water and nitrate or nitric acid. And this is another equation here instead of complete oxidation of this ammonia or the nitrogen to nitrate, it is getting converted to nitrogen gas. Here we are optimizing the oxygen concentration. We can see that if you supply exactly this amount of oxygen and control the biological process, we will be getting the byproduct as carbon dioxide, water and nitrogen. We, that means, nitrification and denitrification is taking place in the same system. Now, we will see the other method which is commonly used for stabilization of the solids or biosolids, whatever is generated in various treatment process used in wastewater. So, that is nothing but composting. Composting all of us are familiar at least the word because in most of the households we go for this composting. So, we will see what is the composting. Composting is a process in which organic matter undergoes biological degradation to a stable end product. So, see here the organic matter undergoes biological degradation and we are getting a stable end product. It is not that everything is getting converted to carbon dioxide and water, we are getting a stable end product and in composting around 20 to 30 percentage of the volatile solids are getting converted to carbon dioxide and water and remaining will be present in the system. And during the this composting what is happening? Because initially the biosolids are there that will be undergoing degradation. So, the microbial activity in the system will be very, very high and we know that the microbial degradation process it is an exothermic reaction. So, as, as a result of this one what will happen? The system temperature will be increasing up to 60 to 70 degree centigrade and that high temperature will be maintained for a long period of time. So, at this high temperature what will happen? The pathogens whatever is present in the sludge it will be getting destructed. So, that is what I have written here the temperature rises to 50 to 70 degree centigrade due to biological activity and the sludge is exposed to this high temperature for a long period. So, because of that one pasteurization takes place and because of this pasteurization whatever enteric pathogens whatever is present in the sludge everything will be getting destroyed and we will be getting end product which can be used as soil conditioner or manure because it, it will be having very high fertilizer value because only 20 to 30 percentage of the volatile solids is getting destructed and remaining volatile solids will be there and nitrogen, phosphorus, etcetera, the nutrients whatever is present in the solids that also will be remaining in the end product. So, it will be having high fertilizer value. So, most of the time the end product of composting is being used as a soil conditioner or a fertilizer. And composting we can 
do either in aerobic condition or anaerobic condition. Most of the time people prefer aerobic composting. The reason is it will not give any mal orders or it will not be generating any odorous gases. But in anaerobic com composting what will happen? Definitely the solids whatever is coming from the wastewater treatment plant, it will be containing lot of sulphates and sulphur compounds. So, in anaerobic process what will happen? This sulphur will be getting converted to hydrogen sulphide and along with hydrogen sulphide other gases like ammonia and ammonia etcetera will be coming out. So, that will be creating problem. So, now we will discuss about the process microbiology. So, here complete destruction of organic matter coupled with the production of humic acid to produce stabilized end product is taking place. So, the destruction of organic matter is taking place and humic acid is produced and this will be stabilizing in the organic matter whatever is present in the system and the microbes involved in this composting process are bacteria, actinomycetes and fungi. So, a mixed consortium of microorganisms are present in the system. So, it consists of bacteria, fungi and actinomycetes and we get a, we will be getting a stabilized end product. So, what the what is the function of this bacteria? The decomposition of proteins, lipids and fats are basically carried out by the bacteria and as a result the it is generating lot of heat energy. So, the temperature rise in the composting plant or composting system or composting reactor is because of the bacterial activity because bacteria will be acting on the organic matter which consists of carbohydrates, lipids and proteins and fats. So, the degradation takes place or decomposition takes place as a result the temperature will be increasing and actinomycetes and fungi are responsible for the destruction of complex organics and the cellulose because the sludge will be containing lot of cellulose and other complex organic material which the bacteria may not be able to take care or biodecompose. In such cases the actinomycetes and fungi are very very helpful. So, now we will see what are the different phases of composting. So, it can be divided into three groups. First one is mesophilic phase, second one is thermophilic phase and third one is the cooling phase. So, in the mesophilic phase what is happening? The fungi and acid producing bacteria are active. So, they will be decomposing the sludge to a certain extent as a result lot of acid will be take uh, generated in the system and in mesophilic uh, range or mesophilic phase what will happen the microbial activity will be starting slowly. So, as the microbial activity comes up the temperature of the system will be coming up. So, that is what is happening in thermophilic system. Here thermophilic bacteria as well as actinomycetes are active and in cooling, cooling phase what is happening reduction of microbial activity will be taking place and the same time humidity reduction and pH stabilization will be taking place because what is happening in mesophilic uh, phase the pH of the system will be very very low because of the acid produced by the decomposition of the organic matter and thermophilic phase the acid produced thus will be utilized, be utilized by the thermophilic bacteria as well as actinomycetes and cooling phase everything will be getting stabilized. So, this picture shows different phases in detail. So, we can see that this x axis gives the time and y axis gives carbon dioxide respiration or the temperature. So, how it is varying with respect to time. So, initially the temperature when we start the composting process the temperature will be very very low and slowly the microbial activity will be starting. So, this is the mesophilic temperature range. So, here fungi as well as the acid forming bacteria are active and as the microbial activity increases the temperature will be increasing drastically. So, we can see like this and this this range is in the thermophilic temperature range and up from here to here we will be having high rate composting. So, what will happen here we can see that slowly with respect to time the temperature will be coming down. Why the temperature is coming down? 
the microbial activity in the system is decreasing that is why the temperature is coming down. So, this is the degradation stage and this is the curing stage. Here everything is getting degraded and the pH will be varying, the microbial activity will be varying and we will be getting many end products or by products. And in the second stage what is happening? The pH will be getting stabilized and we will be getting a stabilized uh, solid or com, uh, compost and the microbial activity will be coming down. Okay, we can see that the temperature is decreasing, decreasing and it is reaching almost same as the initial temperature. So, here we will be getting a stable and mature compost. So, these are the three different phases that is occurring in any compost process. So, now we will see what all are the steps involved or how to go around for this composting process. So, the steps involved can be divided into five categories. So, one is pre-processing. Here what is happening? We are mixing the dewater sludge with an amendment and or a bulking agent. Because if you provide the sludge or if you put the sludge alone in the compost yard, what will happen? It will be in forming a compact mass and the aeration of the system will be very, very difficult. If the aeration is not there or the air circulation is not there, microbial activity will be less and we will not be getting a mature compost in a short period of time. So, if we can make the air circulation proper, so we can increase the efficiency of the composting. So, that is the purpose of adding this amendments or bulking agents. Most of the time, we add wood chips as the additive or bulking agent. Then first this pre-processing is done, then it undergoes the high rate decomposition. Here we are aerating the compost pile either by the addition of air or by mechanical turning or by both. So, first we are pre-process it and mix the dewatered sludge with the additive or the bulking agent. So, we have a sludge which is not very compact and air circulation is possible in the system. And in the second stage where the high rate decomposition is taking place. So, definitely for the decomposition and we are talking about aerobic composting. So, definitely we have to give air or oxygen supply is essential, external oxygen supply is very much essential. So, this one can be done either by supplying external aeration or mixing the sludge pile by means of mechanical, by mechanical means we can provide aeration. So, sometimes what people do is mechanical mixing as well as external aeration will be practice, practice so that the entire system will be under aerobic condition which will definitely increase the efficiency of the system. And in the third step, okay, because this is recovery of bulking agent because we have done the pre treatment and high rate composting is our. So, next one is the curing step. In the curing step, what we can do is this bulking agent will not be undergoing any decomposition in that period. So, we can recover this bulking agent and we can reuse this bulking agent. So, the third step is recovery of the bulking agent and after that one again allow the treated sludge for further curing and the next step is post processing. Okay, here what we do is usually the screening for the removal of non-biodegradable materials such as metals and plastics. Most of the non-biodegradable materials like plastics and metals will be removed before the composting, but some materials will be left over in the sludge. So, this we can remove after the curing process. Then once this post processing is over, we can deposit or we can put this one or use this one as a manure or soil conditioner that is known as the final deposition. So, we will discuss once again what all are the steps involved. First one is the pre-processing and second one is the high rate decomposition. Here most of the microbial activity is taking place and to enhance the microbial activity we provide aeration by external means and sometimes mechanically mix the sludge pile also. And third step is recovery of the bulking agent because bulking agent will not be getting distracted during the composting process. So, we can reuse this bulking agent and third step, fourth step is further curing. So, that the pH of the system will be getting stabilized, the humidity of the system will be coming down and the microbial activity will be getting reduced. 
then the next step is post processing. In post processing what we do? Okay, whatever the non biodegradable material left over in the biosolids, we can remove at this stage. Then finally, we will be getting a mature compost which can be used for soil conditioning or most of the time it is used as a fertilizer which is having lot of fertilizer value. So, this is the flow diagram for a composting compost process. The sludge is coming here and we are adding amendments or bulking, bulking agent and here the pre-processing is taking place. After the pre-processing, the high rate degradation phase is happening. So, after the high rate phase, what we are doing is we are removing the bulking agent. So, whatever is removed, it is being recycled and it is coming back to the pre-processing unit. Then again, we go for the curing. After curing, also whatever the material we are getting, okay, certain materials we can recycle. Then post-processing, post-processing the material whatever we are recovering, we can use or most of them will be having some resale value and the compost, a portion of the compost will be recycled to the pre-processing system. So, that we can increase the air circulation of the sludge whatever is coming in the pre-processing unit and whatever is the compost product, the mature compost product, we can use it as a manure. So, this is the flow diagram of a composting process. Now, we will see how can we uh, divide this composting process. Usually, we can divide the composting process into two categories. I am talking about aerobic composting. One is agitated composting and another one is static pile composting. In aerated static pile composting, as the name indicate, the pile will be laying, pile will be in a static condition, nobody is going to mix it up. So, here what is do, what is happening is a grid of aeration or exhaust piping over which a mixture of dewatered sludge and bulking agents are placed and most of the time the bulking agent is wood chips and we give a decomposition period of 21 to 28 days and curing for 30 days and usually the height of this sludge pile is varying from 2 to 2.5 meter. So, this is the example. Okay. So, this is the aeration pipeline, okay, grid, grid of grid. Okay. So, we can see that one and it is connected to a exhaust fan okay. and this is the air and this is this grid, grid will be going underneath of this one and over which we are putting the compost or the solids mixed with the bulking agent. So, this is the sludge and the bulking agent and this is undergoing high rate decomposition and we are supplying the air and finally, what is happening after this one the decomposition is taking place and this is the curing stage. So, after curing we will be getting matured compost. So, this is screened or unscreened compost this portion this is sludge and the bulking agent and with respect to time what is happening this once it is decomposed this will be coming here and new sludge and bulking agent will be coming here and this is the perforated pipe and the sludge whatever we are using for the composting, it will be decomposed sludge. Now, it is dewatered de sludge not decomposed, dewatered sludge mixed with bulking agent. So, this is a full stack we can see here and this is the air and this is the exhaust fan and whatever the water coming from here, this is the train or condensate, whatever is escaping from the composting pile okay, we can collect through this one and another one is the agitated one it is known as windrow, windrow means we are mixing the sludge frequently. So, this is also commonly used for the composting of organic solids or sludge. Okay. So, here mixing and screening are similar to aerated static file and here we give a height of 1 to 2 meter and a width of 2 to 4.5 meter and usually we use mechanical aerators and along with mechanical aerators the agitation of the sludge. So, composting period that means total 
degradation as well as curing, curing period is 21 to 28 days. The other case it was the degradation itself was 21 to 28 days and curing the same amount of time we were giving and here because the mechanical agitation is there and we are supplying air by mechanical means, it is the aeration will be much better in this windrow process compared to the static pile process, but maintain aerobic condition throughout the sludge pile or the sludge is very, very difficult because you know that the sludge is having very high consistency. So, it is very, very difficult to provide continue complete aerobic condition. So, in even in windrow process aerobic facultative and anaerobic conditions prevail and when we turn the sludge because of this facultative and anaerobic condition whenever the turning takes place offensive orders will be coming out because of the anaerobic digestion the odorous gases will be produced. So, whenever we mix the sludge the odorous gases will be escaping from the solid and it will be creating the odor problem. And the third type of composting is nothing but in vessel composting system. So, everything will be put it in a vessel and it is a closed one. So, the composting will be taking place there inside that system and we will be having a conducive environment for the microorganism for the degradation of the organic sludge. So, here we are it is a an enclosed container or a vessel mechanical systems to minimize orders and process time by controlling environmental conditions such as air flow, temperature and oxygen concentration. So, when we go for in vessel composting system, we have a better control over the system. So, we can minimize the order by providing aerobic conditions as much as possible and we can control the process time by increasing the microbial activity and this is achieved by providing suitable environmental conditions such as proper and uniformly distributed air flow, high temperature and high oxygen concentration. And this in vessel composting system can be classified into two major categories, one is plug flow and another one is agitated bud or we can call it as a completely stirred tank system. So, I will show you the picture. So, this is a vertical type of in vessel composting unit and this is a horizontal flow system. So, here what is happening is the material to be composted is fed here and here there is a mixture so that it will be ensuring uniform mixing of the or uniform feeding of the sludge and this is the composting mix. So, the sludge will be coming through this reactor and here it will be having lot of microbial, uh, microbial activity will be taking place here. As a result what will happen? The sludge whatever we are providing it will be getting stabilized and we can get the composted material here and air is supplied from here and air and odorous gases, air and gas gases to order control system. So, whatever the gas is coming, it will be sent to a air pollution control system. So, that will be taking care of the odorous gases that is coming along with the air. And this is a horizontal system, this is a movable diagram and this is the hydraulic ram. Here we are sending the material to be decomposed and finally, here we will be getting the composted material. This is the air distribution and this is the air removal, whatever the air removal is there, okay, this air we can send it to for the treatment to remove the odorous material. So, this is a, this can be plug flow or if you mix it properly then it will be getting converted to a agitated type or a CSTR type com, in, in vessel composting device. So, when we talk about the composting, what are the design considerations we have to talk about, okay. We have to deal with the total volume, we should know what is the total volume of sludge we have to treat and what is the total weight of the sludge we have to treat because these things are very, very important. So, total volume will give you an idea about the reactor volume and total wet weight that will be giving you. So, we have to design the structure and all accordingly and total solid content, okay. From this one we can find out what is the digestive sludge we are going to get, what is the gas that is going to generated, etcetera. 
and we want to know what is the volatile solids content okay because this is the one which can be degraded and the water content is very very important bulk density is very important and percent water content and percent volatile solids of the compost mix so these all are informations essential for designing a proper composting system and sometimes what people do is instead of treating the solids whatever is coming from the wastewater treatment plants separately there if you want to treat it we have to dewater it then we have to add some bulking agents and all those things to avoid that one the composting can be done along with the municipal solid waste so this is known as co composting so both bio solids and municipal solid waste are composted together so this is having many advantages the major advantage is sludge dewatering may not be required the reason is municipal solid waste water content will be very very less so that will be taking care of the water content of the sludge whatever we wanted to treat so if you mix it together the sludge dewatering can be avoided the overall metals metals contents of the composted material will reduce because the municipal solid waste will be having very less metal concentration whereas the sludge whatever is coming from the waste water treatment plant will be having very high concentrations of metals because the microorganisms can by accumulate the heavy metals whatever is present in the system so what will happen if you mix the bio solids along with the municipal solids the total sludge whatever we are getting that will be having less concentrations of toxic metals which get accumulated in the system that can be reduced and usually a 2 is to 1 ratio of municipal solid waste to sludge is recommended so that means two portion of municipal solid waste and one portion of the solid one person one portion of the sludge from the waste treatment plants can be used for this co composting and when we go for this composting we have to be very very careful about the public health and environmental issues because this will be containing pathogens and all other problematic substances so when we handle the composting plants okay once it is completely cured and when we get the matured compost that will not be having any problem because the pathogens are completely destructed but otherwise what will happen the pathogens will be there so it can enter in, into our body by inhalation or through skin or when we are handling the compost and afterwards we are, if you are not washing your hand properly what will happen the through the hand the pathogens can enter into our body so the workers whoever is dealing with this composting they should be very very careful about this aspects another problem is the aerosols whatever is generated while mixing the compost because we have seen that in windrows process we have to mix the compost mechanically so that also can create some health hazard so we have to be very very careful so today we were discussing about the stabilization process so we have seen three process or four process in detail those are one is alkaline stabilization then anaerobic digestion aerobic digestion and composting among this four process the most commonly used ones are anaerobic sludge digestion and composting and anaerobic sludge digestion we can go for standard rate or high rate reactors and composting also we can go for aerobic process or anaerobic process but we have to be careful about the health hazards whatever is associated with this process next day we'll continue the sludge stabilization Thank you.